My name is Kenneth Wrights, and I work for a subsidiary of Heroku called Salesforce. Or, sorry, of Salesforce called Heroku. <laughs> if only it could actually be that way. Um, so the guy that was going to do the Salesforce presentation unfortunately had to bail. So I'm, but I had happened to be in town for the a uh, hackathon yesterday. So I'm going to do a quick uh, API presentation that I have. Um, so hi, my name is Kenneth Wrights. You can follow me on Twitter at, at Kenneth Wrights. And if you know who I am, it's probably from the open source software that I've developed. I really love open source, and I try to live my life in as much of an open source way as possible. Uh, my most popular project is called <coughs> um, Requests, which is HTTP for humans. Essentially, it's really hard to do HTTP connections in Python, so I try to make it as simple and easy as possible to do that and uh, take the most pragmatic approach possible. And this is a very popular project that a lot of people use. Um, kind of does all the best practices for like content type negotiation and um, link headers and all this kind of cool stuff. So if you're in really into APIs, it's a really good library to look at um, if you're doing Python. Some other things that I've written that uh, you might be familiar with, there is HTTP bin, which is a service that I developed for requests. When I was developing it, I needed to write unit tests. And it was a little bit frustrating to try to like actually find out what a client was sending. So if you're trying to kind of debug anything in an API that you're working with or a client, uh, you can send this thing requests. Like right here, we're just sending a simple get request to the uh, get endpoint on HTTP bin. And it gives you just a simple JSON response showing exactly what the client sent. So you can go through and debug all the headers and do cool stuff like that. Uh, it'll also go through and you can like ask it to give you basic authentication uh, challenges and things like that. So there's a lot of different test scenarios and redirects and all kinds of cool stuff for debugging. Um, did a bunch of other stuff too that you might uh, be familiar with, but we're going to skip all that. I think we're a little pressed for time today. So we're all here for various reasons. I think we all have different purposes for why we use APIs and why we build them. So you have the product guys, which are essentially the non-technical co-founders that try to uh, build better products and build a better world around them. You have the sales guys, which are the hustlers, the marketers, which are the spammers. And you have the designers, which are the pixel pushers, and the developers, which are just those code monkeys that sit in the corner and kind of make things happen right, for everybody else. So when you look at all these different people, though, I think we really have a lot in common when we actually look at what we do. And at the end of the day, we're all makers. Um, we all try to craft different experiences and interfaces. So the product guys are visionaries. They're really trying to like, change the world around them or in the organization or whatever world that they happen to be in. Uh, the sales guys are you know, trying to get more people at the top of the funnel or you know, going through the funnel. And really what they're doing is trying to make your product and your company sustainable, which is extremely important. The marketers are all about communication with everybody using your product. And the designers are they try to make and uh, hone the experience and the philosophy behind your product. And your developers, again, make the magic happen. They're just kind of the people in the background. But I'm just going to focus on the developers today, unfortunately, because developers are awesome. So there's this great quote by Steve Jobs that was unveiled recently. There was like these weird uh, tapes that were unveiled, like this two-hour interview from way back that were never released. So these came out like a month ago. And one of the really cool quotes that was in there, I was listening to this, was, um, so it was 1983, really long, long time ago. It was before Apple was tremendously popular or anything. They were still a really small company building really small products. And there's just this great quote that he said. And it's essentially that people are going to be spending two or three hours a day with these machines. He was referring to the Apple computer, obviously, um, which is more time than they spend with their car on a daily basis. So software design must be given at least as much consideration um, as we give automobiles today, if not a whole lot more. So every hour that you spend with a car, you're going to be spending twice as much time or three times as much time with the software that you use every day. And the amount of attention to detail that we put into the software that we use should be way, way more than we put into cars. And obviously, that's not always the case. But that's always been the approach Apple's taken, and I think it worked really well. So if you look at like the industrial design or like the web interfaces, uh, iOS, all these different things that Apple pushes out, all of their products, they try to really put that much attention to detail. And a lot of other people don't do that. Um, and this whole like, ecosystem of, app, of apps and, and great APIs and web services have all built around that same concept. Of you need like a very, if you really refine your uh, attention to detail into these things, then people, it resonates with people, and they, uh, everyone's better off because of it. 
So developers, though, like we are going to be spending eight hours a day in front of all the APIs that we're using every day, right? This is not, we're not even, we're going to be spending more time with APIs than we do with the client software. So why are they treated any differently? I think that all of our APIs need to have even more attention to detail uh, than all of the client software that we use. So if you look at your typical web application, uh, it's kind of comprised into three things. Let's just, this is a very generic type of graph, obviously. You have your, um, say you have a web interface, which is actually like sending HTTP requests that are going back and forth from the server. You have a worker, maybe, which is like doing scheduled tasks and things like that that are happening in the background. And you have tools, which are like to manage it and support it. Like you're configuring your server. You're going to be like adding and removing like users and things like that. Um, what happens is you start to make all these things talk to each other directly when they're all part of the same very large code base with your average like open source. Let's say you're writing a site in like Django or Rails or something. This is kind of what has a tendency to happen. It'll be like sending requests from your API service to your like workers and your supporting services. You're going to be talking directly to your data persistence layer. And all these things start to get really um, bound to each other and doesn't really work out too well. I have a lot of these, sorry. <laughs> This works better in Keynote than in the PDF. There we go. So like, if you have all these things talking to each other in the same code base, it's, it just gets way out of hand really quickly. And things can be really frustrating for a user and as a developer. So when you actually look at your application, you'll notice that you have, let's say, two types of people that are going to be interacting with it. You're going to have your end users and your developers. And these are two different types of users that both can have their own APIs. So you say we. Uh, one way to architect your application is you have a uh, you have your developer API, which is you know the thing that they actually build these applications with, and you have your end user API, which is traditionally like an HTTP website, right? That people are going to be interacting with, HTML. Um, and if you want, you can add another layer in there that both of these are powered by, which can be your internal API, and that can be let's say that's that'll actually do your data persistence and everything like that. So. I think that's just kind of what Layer 7 offers um, other companies like Apogee, where essentially they have an internal API that ha has this all power and talk to the databases and things like that. And then all these other layers can be ab like abstracted and proxied away from that, so that you don't have to worry about um, all, you don't have to worry about the data layer when you're working on the developer side or the end user side. So like you're, if you're working on the front end of your website, you shouldn't have to worry about what database someone's using. You know, if they want to switch from MySQL to Postgres or Oracle or something like that. Um, if you have an architecture like this, then anyone can switch anything at any time and it'll all just work, which is pretty awesome. So if you look at the way like these, this ecosystem of apps in, say, the Apple community works, where all, all, everyone's building all these really great apps, um, they're all talking over HTTP to one another. And it really works really well. So if you have a lot of... Um, you know, like to have a mashup, let's say an app that like you know takes takes some uh, a picture that you took over here and posts it to another site and all these different things that you can interact with and like are changing the world around us socially. Um, these are all just APIs and really it's like changing the world. You see like revolutions happening every day because of um, because of HTTP and because of APIs, which is pretty amazing. And everything that we're building that everyone loves right now is really a remix of all these small different components that they're attaching and composing into larger applications. So um, if we want to build an application where we have uh, a, a lot of focus on our API, there are a couple different things you can do. Uh, the first thing that I like to do is have an issue. Essentially, it's really hard to solve a problem if you can't directly um, experience it firsthand. So if you're not actually the one that has the problem, it's really hard to identify with the person that is having the problem and fixing it properly. So to do this, uh, well, here's an example. I love this application for Windows, uh, back from my Windows days. I don't use it anymore. But it's called OneNote. And it's this like, really great note-taking application that allows you to do this really like freeform um, notes in like this hierarchy. And it doesn't really assume anything about your workflow. You can, have, you can architect things in any way you want and do cross-referencing. And it's... Uh, you can handwrite notes and just like throw files into it, and it always remembers them. It's really nice. Um, but it's only available for Windows, which really is frustrates me because I moved to OS X like you know, six years ago. And like, every day I think to myself, I really wish I had this app on the OS X, but no one will build it. Um, 
but I could build this. And if I built this, I know it would be like one of the best apps ever for me. And I know that the 300 other people that I found online that agree with me and have the same problem will also love this application. It would be really popular and would be really, you know, really successful. Not in, even if it's only between my small group of people and not, you know, it's not this tremendously successful thing, it would uh, solve a problem for the select people and it would do a really good job. So GitHub is another example of a company that was started around this ideal. What they did, um, so two, over two million people collaborate on GitHub every day, which is incredible. And it wasn't really built for the large developer community uh, at any time. They didn't like sit down and think, okay, how can we build something to market to all developers or all people that are you know, building things um, on computers? And what happened was they just built it for themselves. Um, if you're not familiar with GitHub, it's a source control uh, website where people can collaborate with open source or with private code. Um, it uses Git, which is a really great um, um, source control system that allows you to, it's very distributed, so no one, everyone has everything at all times. Um, so they built that for themselves, and it resonated with millions of people, and now everybody uses it. And it's been really successful because they solved it for themselves because they were the ones experiencing the problem firsthand, and they themselves happen to be developers. So some other projects that are like this, there's a Gumroad, which is a really great e-commerce site. Um, and essentially, the guy who's building this wants it to be as simple to sell something online as it is to share a link on like Instagram or Twitter or something like that. Um, and it's been really successful. A lot of people that are really into e-commerce think this is one of like the most revolutionary ideas around. And it's because this guy just wanted to sell something and he couldn't, so he built this whole thing. Uh, 37 Signals, for example, uh, they build Basecamp and all these other collaboration tools for teams, and they didn't build these things for, uh, for other teams. They built it for their team because they needed it, and then it happened to be one of the most successful um, project management softwares, uh, SaaSes, around. Um, and they also made uh, Ruby on Rails um, because they are Rubyists, and they found themselves repeating themselves a lot, so they built a framework, and that's one of the uh, more popular web frameworks out there today. So it's this whole idea of experiencing things firsthand and then solving them firsthand. We don't really have enough time to get into everything. So um, the approach that, this approach that they're taking, I think, is a very pragmatic one. And pragmatic means dealing things, uh, with things sensibly and realistically in a way that is based on practical rather than theoretical considerations. So instead of go out, going out and trying to solve this problem for everybody. They try to just solve it for themselves, which is a very simple thing to do. And it just so happens that millions of people also share that belief. So with my request project that I wrote, um, it's extremely popular. And I, it is a very pragmatic package. So I didn't take this, um, this methodology of trying to literally cram every use case possible that, and try to suit every single person that's going to be using its needs. I just went and I. Uh, essentially tried to build what I wanted for myself. And then you know, it just so happened that there are thousands of other people that have the same problem. Um, so I had, I had a real problem that I solved for myself. And at first, Request was really like not a very powerful library. It was pretty crappy at first. Um, but it like deeply resonated with a lot of people, and more people started to get involved. And over time, the features grew, and the API was never compromised. Um, it's been downloaded like 1.5 million times now. And, uh, a lot of very large, like Fortune 500 companies, use it, um, which is pretty awesome. So, you know, if you're a developer, you can be spend eight hours a day with your API, build an API for yourself, and everyone else will be better off because of it. You're a developer. So to do that, after we have this first-hand problem and we try to solve it, we can respond to the problem, and I do this by writing the README first. Essentially, before any code is written at all, if I'm going to be building an API, be it, let's say, at a language level or at a HTTP level, I will write the text documentation, uh, like some simple usage examples of how, here's how I want to get something done, here's the, the things I will call in my thing that isn't written yet, and here's the response I will get. And you do that before you write a single line of code. Uh, and it's really great. It allows you to actually like build it the way it's supposed to be built properly because you're experiencing the problem firsthand before you actually go through and, uh, and go through all the hard work of architecting it. So instead of uh, engineering something to get the job done, you interact with the problem itself and you build an interface that reacts directly to it. And you discover it and you respond to it. 
So great sculptures aren't engineered or manufactured. Usually a, an artist will go and they'll find a piece of marble and they will build something that works well with the marble that they found. They respond to the marble. Um, they set free something in, hidden that was inside all along. So this is really this thing that you hear about a lot in the design world called responsive design, except for it's brought more into the technical side. Um, responsive design isn't really, is, is anyone in here not familiar with responsive design or know what it is? Cool. So responsive design is when you, ha usually what it is described as, as you have a website and you want it to work on a, on a tablet, on a phone, on the computer, anywhere you go, um, you load it up and the design will work. And uh, essentially, it's about making something that identifies enough with itself to respond into the environment that it's placed in. Um, you know, it knows that something's too small in the size and it can adjust properly and, and all these other different factors. Um, so it's really free of arbitrary constraints. So readme-driven development is really responsive API design. You can place the problem, uh, pl place the code directly into the problem before it's written and then write it properly and then you have a nice pragmatic responsive API. And then once you do that, you can build it. Once you discover the API, uh, you can write all the code necessary to make all the different calls that you made and you document it actually happen. Um, if you have, let's say, one function or one call that looks extremely, comp you know, requires like a thousand lines of code behind it, you can layer it so you can have a lower, lower level, lower level air API, and then have some more, more porcelain layers that the users actually interact with. And uh, that's pretty much it. The API is all that matters, and everything else is, is uh, secondary. So do unto others as you would have them do to you. We're going to adapt that today to build tools for others that you want to be built for you. And how are we doing on time? We good? Yes, okay. Um, there's some pro tips for doing this. Uh, one of them is that c constraints really foster creativity. So I had this idea of open sourcing everything in my life that I try to do. And I like to treat internal projects, let's say at my company, that aren't going to be open source as open source projects. And then all these really great practices start to come to light. So if you look at an open source project, usually they're nice and generic. They're not uh, tightly coupled. They're very abstract. And uh, all the different components in your application, let's say if they're all built like they're open source projects, even though they're internal, um, all the components can become really de concise and decoupled from one another, and they can all have separation of concerns. Um, best practices start to emerge. So for example, if you were going to build a piece of code that was going to be open source that you were going to run internally, you wouldn't keep all your database credentials and all of your secrets, you know, keys to the kingdom in, let's say, the source code repository that would be stored somewhere else. Um, so if you just pretend that your project is going to be open source, then you, that problem goes away. Um, an open source project is essentially completely useless if there's no documentation for it or if there's no tests. So those, those are things that you'll have to build from the beginning because you're forced to. And uh, another side benefit is the code can be released at any time if you are going to open source it, but obviously that's not going to happen. Um, so just before, as we build for open source, uh, you build for services instead of these large monolithic applications, all those same benefits come to light. Um, you have all the different components in your, app, in your ar architecture can become separate from one another. They won't be tightly coupled. You won't have that giant diagram with all those lines that I showed in the beginning. Um, and you'll start having best practices emerge. So you can use ideal tools for different jobs. Uh, for example, Java has some really great things called NIO for doing like tremendous amount of concurrent IO at the same time, like millions and millions of connections. So you know, that small part of your stack could be written in Java and everything else could be written in something else. Uh, that's, that's something that you couldn't do if it was one application. Um, and dog food is delicious. You can start using your own services to build your own services, which is pretty great. Uh, a better way to say that is that uh, champagne, you can sip your own champagne. Um, so I'll leave you with this. I don't know how to say this guy's name. It's Peter Hintgens. He is the founder of a company behind ZeroMQ, which is a very cool uh, messaging system. And it is that simplicity is always better than functionality. Uh, it's always better to remove lines of code uh, than it is to put more lines in. And it's always better to make smaller things that are simpler than one large complicated thing. Any questions? Yes? So often what happens is when you go to, say, write a module to solve a problem, um, people will start to write all the functionality before they write the API. And then 
over time as they need to like add new features, uh, the API will just kind of like be adjusted improperly to fit the new features in when really it would have been better to organize it differently in the beginning. Um, so if you think of the whole thing at that level first, then that problem can go away pretty easily. Yes, so I use a, something called semantic versioning, um, which is essentially, um, it's pretty simple. It's like every, every version of your, uh, I'm trying to think. So you, you know, everything below 1.0 is like fair game to change. You try not to, but uh, once you're 1.0, then everything is totally solid. And then if you make a breaking change at all, you go to 2.0, and then you go to 3.0. Um, so that's, that's pretty good. Cool. Semver.org, S-E-M-V-E-R. Um, which is a lot of open source projects use that. It's pretty great. Anybody else? Awesome. Thank you very much.